Father Anthony Giacotta. In this continuing series of videos, we've been examining what Catholic traditionalists call the question of the Pope. That is, how to reconcile traditional Catholic teaching on papal authority, the obligation to submit to the Roman Pontiff, and the infallibility and indefectibility of the Church with the errors and evils officially approved by the popes of Vatican II. It's a particularly hot question these days. The opposing sides that have squared off are sedevacantists and the R and R camp. Sedevacantists like me maintain that the post-Vatican II popes were not true popes due to public heresy. The R and R camp recognizes the Vatican II popes as true popes, but contends you can resist a pope's teachings, laws, rights, and commands. The most prominent entity in the R and R camp is Bishop Bernard Fellay's Society of St. Pius X, or SSPX, which recently, through its U.S. Seminary Publications arm, bankrolled a book-length assault on sedevacantism by John Salsa and Robert Sisko. The author's remit was to paint sedevacantism and sedevacantists like myself as totally, totally wicked, a task that they undertook with great gusto. Thus, Messer Salsa and Sisko assure us, sedevacantism is, quote, founded upon the same error as Protestantism, anything but Catholic, poisonous, and leads to heresy. Sedevacantists themselves, priests like me, have, quote, lost faith in the church, are like unbelieving Jews who were enemies of Christ and have produced the pernicious fruit of a sect. Bishop Fillet and an array of SSBX priests have lined up to second these wonderful anti sedevacantus epithets and to publicly praise the book as luminous. How did we end up so evil? Who let us down this dark road? If you're looking for luminous, I can shed some light on that. It was the founder of the Society of St. Pius X himself, Marcel Lefebvre, titular Archbishop of Sonata and Phrygia, and Sede the Contest. And that is why it is pure idiocy for SSPX priests to endorse Salsa and Sisko's 700 pages of anti Sede the Contest hyperventilations. If you want to call Sede the Contest like me an enemy of Christ, you better call your founder, Archbishop Lefebvre, one too. Where do you think we got the idea in the first place? This video will tell the story. I studied at the Society of St. Pius X's Seminary in Econ, Switzerland in the 1970s. I knew Monsignor Lefebvre. I saw him in action every day. I heard him preach, I listened to his conferences, and on a few occasions I even went to his office to ask him questions. When I was ordained a priest at Econ in 1977, Bernard Follet was still just a Swiss kid who lived at the bottom of the driveway. Because I had been raised in the old church, I arrived at Archbishop Lefebvre Seminary with worries about the question of the Pope. To understand how he led so many of us towards sedevacantism as the answer, it is necessary to speak about the atmosphere and the mentality of the clergy and seminarians at Econ in its early days. Here is a photo from October 1971. While everyone who entered Econ adhered to Catholic tradition in some sense, there seemed to be no firm agreement on what this meant. One side wanted SSPX to be a religious congregation that had official approval, but would retain certain traditional practices while not condemning the Vatican II changes as non-Catholic. 
These were the soft liners. On the other side were the hard liners. They wanted SSPX to fight the modernist heretics sitting in high places of authority in the post-Vatican II institution. The older American seminarians who entered Econ in the early days tended to be hardliners. Clarence Kelly and Donald Sanborn in 1971, Daniel Dolan in early 73, myself in 75, and William Jenkins in 76. We had all previously been in various seminaries and religious orders in the U.S., where we encountered the ugly face of modernism close up, where we fought back, and where we were persecuted for it. We weren't at a cone to follow Monsignor Lefebvre. We were there to be priests who provided a valid mass and sacraments where there were none, and who fought against the heretics who were destroying the church. The underlying question that divided the two factions at Hakon, but was seldom stated, was, are the modernists Catholics? Or are the changes of Vatican II a true form of the Catholic religion? Or can someone who promotes the changes of Vatican II truly lay claim to the name Catholic? Archbishop Lefebvre, alas, never definitively answered these questions and gave both sides something to work with. This zigzagging reflected the two sides of Archbishop Lefebvre's character or personality. The fearless iron bishop who hated the modernist heresy with every fiber of his being, and the smooth, widely experienced papal diplomat looking to reconcile opposites through patient negotiation. This is not to denigrate him and certainly not to portray him as insincere or two-faced. The archbishop was deeply devout and utterly genuine. Conscious of his episcopal dignity without being pompous, well-balanced and optimistic in temperament, correct with his rubrics and graceful in the celebration of mass, a riveting and eloquent preacher, respectful and considerate toward national differences in culture, temperament, and practices, and, always a big plus in my book, the possessor of a good sense of humor. He was, in short, a man of many, many virtues, as those of us who knew him, and even later clashed with him, pointed out at great length on several occasions. Be that as it may, Archbishop Lefebvre's refusal to provide definitive answers to basic questions engendered the fundamental theological confusion that has plagued the society of St. Pius X ever since, for 45 years. You can see it behind many of the four dozen internal SSPX disputes I cataloged in an earlier video, SSPX and Bitter Fruit. So, hardliners were purged one year, softliners the next, and then vice versa, as the archbishop wavered back and forth and back and forth. Meanwhile, the only clerics who survived long-term were the archbishop liners. They showed no loyalty to any principle beyond Archbishop Lefebvre or the society. For them, he was a substitute for the magisterium of the church and his organization, the Ark of Salvation. They followed whatever the line of Monsignor seemed to be on a given day, Pope good, Pope bad, or Pope not the Pope. They were the true followers of the Archbishop because they did not think. But needless to say though, a few of us did think. And thanks to a combination of the influences present at Econ in its early days, and principles enunciated by Archbishop Lefebvre himself, we concluded that Paul VI was a false pope and that the Holy See was vacant. And here, we must mention the term sedevacantism, 
which has come to be the term for the theological position that the Holy See is vacant. I never heard the word at Acone. I think the first time I encountered it was in the Angelus, several years after my ordination. But the idea behind it, that Paul VI was somehow not a true pope, was widespread among the hardliners at Acone when I was there. We would have been hard-pressed at that point to explain in formal theological terms how this might be possible. But the sense of the Catholic faith we possessed told us that there was a great disconnect between what Paul VI did and what he claimed to be. Many of the English speakers and some of the French heartliners referred to Paul VI as the monster, an imprecation some of us had heard an Italian lady hurl at his picture in a Roman religious goods store. A colorful term, to be sure, but a perfect one for a modernist. To our way of thinking, it described Montini exactly, an ugly, half-and-half -half creature who hated the Catholic faith and who was on a vicious rampage to destroy Catholicism. In the society's early days, the notion that Paul VI was not a true pope was certainly not a thought crime. It was the position of priests whom the archbishop clearly respected. Father Noel Barbara, for instance. Here is another photo of him with the archbishop visiting Padre Pio. Also, Father Gerard de Laurier, a professor at Icone. So too, Father Peter Morgan, District Superior of England, and the first SSPX priest, Archbishop Lefevre, ordained. And then there were the very words of Archbishop Lefevre himself, which repeatedly pointed us towards Sedevacantism. In 1976, the year before I was ordained a priest, Archbishop Lefevre clearly laid out all the principles behind it, as you'll see in a moment. As a result, I never prayed for Paul VI as Pope, even at my ordination mass, and as organist I would not even accompany the chant for him at benediction. As late as August 1979, Sede Vicantism was still not a crime in the society. At a priest's dinner in the Priory at Oyster Bay Cove, Long Island, I directly asked the Archbishop whether religious liberty was a heresy. He said it was. I then said that, well, since John Paul II teaches it, shouldn't we draw the conclusion? He smiled at what the pushy American was asking and replied, I would not say that the Pope is not the Pope, but neither would I say that you cannot say the Pope is not the Pope. He laughed, as we all did, because in French this comes out with a lot of popping P sounds. But we took the Archbishop at his word. Unfortunately, three months later, Archbishop Lefevre's diplomatic corps side kicked in. With JP II in office, the prospect of a Vatican Acone deal was in the air. On November 8, 1979, therefore, Archbishop Lefevre issued a declaration saying the society, quote, could not tolerate in its bosom, unquote, those who did not recognize John Paul II as Pope, who refused to put his name into the canon, and who did not recognize the new mass in Latin as valid. In late May 1980, Archbishop Lefebvre visited us again at Oyster Bay. And after we refused to adhere to the new line, he expelled three of us. But the next morning, without any urging from us, he changed his mind. All would be well as long as we didn't publicly attack the position of the society, he said, adding that it would not be necessary to put JP II's name into the liturgical prayers either. The turnabout, I think, reflected another facet of the Archbishop's virtue. We suspected that some of the young Turks who had his ear pushed him to expel us, 
but that his kindly and fatherly side, which was quite considerable, won out in the end. And we were most grateful to him for it. And there it stood. Archbishop Lefebvre left three priests, whom SSPX's current flax would say lost faith in the church and were like unbelieving Jews, to run the society's northeast district. Oy vey. Three years later, the Archbishop expelled nine of us from the Society of St. Pius X. The issue, though, was not Sedevacantism, and I've told that story elsewhere. Even after subsequent open conflicts with Sedevacantus, however, Archbishop Lefebvre in later years still held out the Sedevacantus position as a potentially tenable one for Catholics, because Rome, Archbishop Lefebvre's code word for the Pope, had lost the faith. If you want further evidence of Archbishop Lefebvre's willingness to consort with clerics who adhere to a position that Messrs. Salsa and Sisko say is anything but Catholic, is poisonous, and leads to heresy, look to June 1988. Archbishop Lefebvre's co-consecrator for the Four Society of St. Pius X bishops was Bishop Antonio de Castro Mayer, who, after the ceremony, went around declaring to anyone who would listen, we have no Pope. And finally, even the Society of St. Pius X of 2016 tolerates the presence of priests who are sedevacantists, as long as they are quiet about it. If these clerics are, as the authors of the book that Bishop Fillet praises, enemies of Christ, and like unbelieving Jews, how can he allow them to remain in his organization? So, having provided some historical perspective, we now turn our attention to the pro Vacantis pronouncements that Archbishop Lefebvre made over the years. Now, you will not find these statements in the Salsa Cisco book. Instead, you will find three paragraphs in the preface, telling us that the Sede Vacante question, quote, weighed heavily on the Archbishop, that he was a, quote, prudent churchman, and that, quote, he preferred to wait, and that Bishop Tissier assures us that really, truly, Archbishop Lefebvre wanted to defer the issue to some future pope and cardinals. Right. But both Bishop Fillet and the authors have also assured us that their book is comprehensive and systematic. So why not just give us a series of quotes from Archbishop Lefebvre and let the man speak for himself? Because, as Salsa, Cisco, and Bishop Fillet know full well, these quotes pull the rug out from under what their book aimed to achieve. If the old Evec de Fer, the old Iron Bishop himself, said so many things that favor Sedevacantism, how can you possibly portray Sedevacantists, especially priests who personally knew the Archbishop and now adhere to this position, as diabolical crypto-Lutherans? What does this say about Lefebvre himself? With that in mind, we now present, in the form of a catechism, some of the Archbishop's statements favoring Sedevacantism. What are we to think of the Vatican II errors and the institution that teaches them? The Church which affirms such errors is both schismatic and heretical. This conciliar Church is therefore not Catholic. If a pope adheres to this new conciliar church, what is the effect? To whatever extent pope, bishops, priests, or faithful adhere to this new church, they separate themselves from the Catholic church. Is it possible that even the pope himself could break with the church? 
to whatever extent the Pope departed from tradition, he would become schismatic, he would breach with the Church. Theologians such as St. Bellarmine, Cajetan, Cardinal Journet, and many others have studied this possibility. So it is not something inconceivable. Are we certain that Paul VI is a true Pope? While we are certain that the faith the Church has taught for 20 centuries cannot contain error, we are much further from absolute certitude that the Pope is truly Pope. Is it possible that Paul VI might not have even been a true Pope in the first place? Heresy, schism, ipso facto excommunication, invalidity of election are so many reasons why a Pope might in fact never have been Pope or might no longer be one. What situation would Catholics be in? In this obviously very exceptional case, the Church would be in a situation similar to that which prevails after the death of a pontiff. What happens to a Pope who fails in transmitting the truth? It seems inconceivable that a successor of Peter could fail in some way to transmit the truth which he must transmit. For he cannot, without as it were disappearing from the papal line, not transmit what the popes have always transmitted. Would he continue to be pope? If it happened that the pope was no longer the servant of truth, he would no longer be pope. Since religious liberty is, as you say, Monseigneur, heresy, and John Paul teaches it, shouldn't we draw the obvious conclusion? I would not say that the Pope is not the Pope, but neither would I say that you cannot say the Pope is not the Pope. Is it conceivable, Monsignor, that you yourself could become a Sedevacantist one day? You know, for some time many people, the Sedevacantists, have been saying there is no more Pope. But I think that for me it was not yet the time to say that because it was not sure, it was not evident. If John Paul II continues his course of action, what will be the consequences? These recent acts of the Pope and bishops with Protestants, animists, and Jews, are they not an active participation in non-Catholic worship as explained by Canon Nas on Canon 1258.1? In which case, I cannot see how it is possible to say that the Pope is not suspect of heresy, and if he continues, he is a heretic, a public heretic. That is the teaching of the Church. What conclusions might you draw from John Paul's words and deeds? It is possible we may be obliged to believe this Pope is not Pope. For 20 years, Monsignor de Castro Meyer and I preferred to wait. But Monsignor, has the Pope left the Catholic Church? It is impossible for Rome to remain indefinitely outside tradition. It's impossible. For the moment they are in rupture with their predecessors, this is impossible. They are no longer in the Catholic Church. It would be possible, of course, to assemble a collection of quotes entitled Marcel Lefebvre anti Vacantist or Marcel Lefebvre Recognize and Resister, and one would find an equal amount of material. He was, in fact, all of these at one time or another. But the words we've quoted from Marcel Lefebvre Sedevacantist will suffice for our one purpose here to shoot the hot air out of the Society of St. Pius X's cynical attempt through Messrs. Salsa and Sisko to demonize Sedevacantism and to paint those who adhere to it as the spawn of Luther. Don't believe it, folks. For Archbishop Lefebvre, 
Sedevacantism was a tenable position for a Catholic to hold. He initially laid down many of the principles that led us to it. And at several points during the life of his apostolate, he openly suggested that he himself, though but a retired bishop, might declare the Holy See vacant. And note something else. Archbishop Lefebvre certainly didn't hint that before doing so, he'd need to wait for the College of Cardinals or a General Council of Bishops to conduct a trial proving the crime of heresy, a thesis to which Messrs. Salsa and Sisko devote 100 pages of their wooden and indignant prose. The Archbishop, having been a missionary, was an eminently practical man. Whatever objections he may have voiced against Sedevacantism at various times, this artificial rigmarole certainly wasn't one of them. Had he become convinced that his duty as a Catholic priest and bishop for the good of souls was to declare the Holy See vacant, rest assured it would have been lock and load. And in the age of Bergoglio, the Pope who says there is no Catholic God, who countenances divorce, who approves contraceptives, what do you think Archbishop Lefebvre would be telling us about Bergoglio? Would it be to heed Salsa and Sisko's solemn warning to hold our fire until a college of cheesehead, balloon-carrying, sax-playing, jeans-clad, modernist cardinals convene a general council of bishops against him? And then to wait for a public judgment against Bergoglio from a council of men like these? Are you kidding? Those of us who actually knew Archbishop Lefebvre have no doubt whatsoever about what he would say now, because he already said it nearly 30 years ago. Rome has lost the faith, my dear friends. Rome is in apostasy. These are not words in the air, it is the truth. Rome is in apostasy. They have left the church. This is sure, sure, sure. How right you were then, Monsignor. How right you still are now.